I'd la now like to uh, introduce um, a friend uh, for a long time, Diane Williams, who is the founder and president of the Source of Synergy Foundation, which taps into the infinite source of collective consciousness, creativity, and potential for the common good. Diane was the first chairperson of the NGO Committee on Spirituality, Values, and Global Concerns uh, in New York. She also served as co-chair and co-founder of this committee at the UN in Geneva, where it originated. She is a founding member of the Council of the Spiritual Caucus, was a representative for Tribal Link Foundation, uh, Director of International and UN Affairs at the uh, Interfaith Center of New York for the very Reverend James Parks Morton, former Dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and a great spiritual leader in his own right. Uh, she was also, Diane was also representative at the Temple of Understanding. So Diane, please, you're going to share with us a spiritual history of uh, the United Nations. I just wanted to start by thanking Jeannie and all the members of the Executive Council of the CSBGC and everybody that played a role in putting together today's program. It's really wonderful to see everybody and such an honor to be here. Um, and when Ambassador Chaudhry walked in today, he said this is the 10th anniversary, which I didn't realize. Um, and then I also was reminiscing a little bit about the very first, um, well, we had the Spirit of the UN event, which was part of the 60th anniversary. And I was thinking about that event, and I remember how much positive feedback we got from that, because people's spirits were really uplifted. We had uh, uh, life-size birthday cake, balloons, and even hula dancers, <laughs> courtesy of Audrey and her friends, um, uh, hula down the aisles of the conference room one. Um, so it was quite a celebration, and we also um, honored some very special people um, at that uh, event, as well as Ambassador Chadri, who was our very first awardee. Um, so it's really such a pleasure to be here. So I was asked to talk about the spiritual history of the UN in about five minutes, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a very condensed uh, history. Um, and I'm going to read my remarks, because I have a lot to, to say. Um, so today we are honoring and celebrating very special um, each of whom embodies the spirit of the United Nations. Through their work, they express the core principles, spirit, and vision which the United Nations was founded, and their presence emits a special energy that captures the true essence of the United Nations. Um, I wish to congratulate all of you, and also thank you for serving with such dedication, heart, and spirit. Um, I also wish to acknowledge all the past awardees that are present today, including Ambassador Chaudhry and others. Which uh, Can you raise your hands? Because I know Deborah Muldal, Pamela Kraft, Sharon Hamilton, Monica, Monica. Willard. Um, are there anybody else here? So we also thank you for your work and, and congratulations. Um, I, okay, so I would like to briefly speak today about the spiritual history of the UN. I think it's important to state that from the very beginning, the United Nations was built upon a spiritual foundation. As the founders and key players, including those who are, we are honoring today, were and still are guided by universal values, spiritual principles, and practices. The vision, starting with the League of Nations in 1919, ignited a dream for a universal organization that would create unity and harmony among nations. In December of 1944, the DeBarton Oaks Declaration was announced in San Francisco. The key countries that were addressing the UN Charter listed 12 major functions of the United Nations. One of these functions was to be the seeker of freedom. And in defining this term, it said that for humans to attain ultimate freedom, the United Nations not only had to promote material growth, but also spiritual growth. After World War II, the soul and spirit of humanity was greatly suffering and needed more than material reconstruction. Unfortunately, spiritual growth never made it into the Charter, but it has and continues to be very present within the UN system. A monumental event occurred in June of 1945 when representatives of 51 countries adopted the Charter of the United Nations, that Ambassador Chaudhry just held up, at a conference in San Francisco. 
This was the first time in the entire history of humanity that nations came together to form an intergovernmental organization with a mission of promoting international cooperation. That's quite a, quite a feat. This to me is a spiritual vision, and all those that helped the United Nations to form and evolve over the years, I believe, are engaging in a very high form of spiritual practice. A spiritual practice is often defined as a performance of actions and activities undertaken for the purpose of inducing a spiritual experience and cultivating spiritual development that moves a person or community towards a goal. That goal is often the experience of feeling union, unity with each other and our true nature. This unity is what the United Nations was built upon. I would like to take us back in time and share how some of the UN Secretary Generals have embodied the spirit of the United Nations and helped to build it as a unifying body that expresses the consciousness of the world. In 1956, the second Secretary General, Doug Hammarskjöld, with the cooperation of the layman's movement, set out to redesign what we now call the meditation room in the UN lobby. And if you haven't visited it, I would encourage you to do that today. It's right in the main lobby. Um, in November 1957, um, they transformed the meditation room and reopened it. It was to create an atmosphere of stillness. Um, they placed a six and a half ton triangular block of crystalline iron ore in the middle of the room with a beam of light from an unseen source on the stone, a symbol of the light of the sky and the earth, the only symbol in the room. Doug Hammarskjöld said, I would like to think of this symbol as our own divine light as well. He said, this house must have one room, one place which is dedicated to silence, dedicated to silence in the inner sense and stillness in the outer sense. We must do everything possible in creating such a room to create an atmosphere where people can really withdraw into themselves and feel the void. We want to bring back the stillness which we have lost in our streets and in our conference rooms, and to bring it back in a setting which no noise would impinge upon our imagination. We want to bring back the idea of worship, devotion to something which is greater and higher than we are ourselves. The United Nations is one of the world's most sacred places. It always feels to me like one is stepping on holy ground when one walks into the building as the destiny of so many depend upon its success. That is why I think it's important for all of those that are supporting the work of the United Nations to visit the meditation room on a regular basis, to find that point of stillness within, and send our spiritual support to the UN. Other Secretary Generals recognize the significance of stillness in meditation. Yu Tan, the third Secretary General, was a Buddhist who meditated at home every morning before driving to the UN. He said, Meditation is a process that cleanses the mind of impurities. It cultivates such qualities as concentration, awareness, intelligence, and tranquility, leading finally to the attainment of the highest wisdom. He also said, as a Buddhist, I was brought up not, not only to develop the spirit of tolerance, but also to cherish moral and spiritual qualities, especially modesty, humility, compassion, and most important, to attain a certain degree of emotional equilibrium. I was taught to control my emotions through a process of concentration and meditation, he said. He went on to say, I am always conscious of the fact that I'm a member of the human race. This consciousness prompted me to work for the great synthesis, which is implicit, impl implicit in the goal of the world organization I had the privilege of serving. Long before I was appointed Secretary General, I used to dwell at some length on the oneness of human consciousness and human community. There has also been a clear call from other leaders of the UN to honor our humanity by realizing and embodying universal values that are deeply ingrained in the human spirit itself, such as the ones in the Charter of the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In addressing the Millennium Peace Summit of Religious and Spiritual Leaders, the seventh Secretary General, Kofi Annan, stated several times of the importance of the non-material, the spiritual. He said, at the heart, we are dwelling with universal values, to be merciful, to be tolerant, to love thy neighbor. 
And he added, there is no mystery here. Such values are deeply ingrained in the human spirit itself. It is little wonder that such values animate the Charter of the United Nations and lie at the root of our search for world peace. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, there are moments in history when our humanity fills us with hope and courage, when we discover our common spirituality and values and build a shared vision of where the future must lead. We are at such a moment today and we must seize it. Our incumbent Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently said, the ability to be an advocate for our true universal values is essential in the Secretary Secretary General's job to strengthen the UN. We know his life has embodied these values, including humility and empathy, in particular through his work with refugees. He recently said during his time as Secretary General, he plans to put a special emphasis on the empowerment of women and girls and to work to ensure the human dignity of every person. He said, over the last 10 years, I have witnessed firsthand the suffering of the most vulnerable people on earth. I have visited war zones and refugee camps where one might ask, what happened to the dignity and worth of the human person? What has, what has made us immune to the plight of those most socially and economically un, 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 underprivileged? All this makes me feel the acute responsibility to make human dignity the core of my work. So I think we're very lucky to have the Secretary General coming in. There are also many other key players in the UN community that are supporting the spiritual evolution of the UN, including the thousands of UN staff members, consultants, diplomats, and the NGOs and consultative relationship with the United Nations that work closely with the UN on all issues, including groups that aim to bring spirituality uh, and the values dimension more deeply into the work of the UN. And they're including the Values Caucus, Julie is there, I don't know if Carl's here, and Gayatri. Um, um, the Spiritual Caucus at the UN, um, the UN Staff and Recreation Council has a Society for Enlightenment and Transformation, there's a Feng Shui group, there's the Global Movement for a Culture of Peace, the Culture of Peace, I don't know, I think we have some people here from that group, and as well as the Spiritual Caucus, I see. The Committee of the Religious NGOs, the NGO Committee on the Decade of World's Indigenous Peoples, Pam's here. Um, there's been meditation groups that have been meditating at the UN for more than 40 years, like the Sri Chimnoy group and Aquarian Age, many, many um, communities, one in Geneva, almost 50 years. Um, so um, spirituality is very alive and present. Um, the groups I mentioned all do their best to help expand the consciousness of the United Nations so that decisions are being made in a way that takes values, ethics, spirituality, and the inherent worth of each individual into account. So while we do select a, a very, uh, very special uh, group of people, individuals, each year to receive the Spirit of the UN Award, we also recognize it's the spirit of all those that put their energy and commitment into making the UN thrive that makes up the soul, consciousness, and spirit of the United Nations and drives it to evolve to its highest potential. So today is about honoring all of these people as well. So spirituality and universal values are alive, well, growing, and evolving at the UN. And in closing, I just wanted to say a quote by Doug Hammarskjöld, the second, sec second Secretary General. He's often quoted as having said, we can only succeed in achieving world peace if there's a spiritual renaissance on the planet. So together, let us use the awareness and wisdom from our deepest source to usher in the spiritual renaissance for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. <laughs>